and this is uh, an instance of that. When you go on a journey, you have a number of facilities provided by Almighty Allah for you that you can take advantage of while on a journey. Because again, I'm saying, the only, let me put that caveat, the only excuse that one may have for not praying every day is when he or she loses his or her senses. That is the only excuse. That someone has gone mad, may Allah preserve us and protect all of us. Mm. That is the only excuse. And in such a case, you don't even need to repay it. No matter how long or short the number of days will be that one is out of his or her senses, he or she is completely exempted and excused. And we don't pray that any of us belong to that category. And those who are in that category, the Almighty Allah grants them a quick recovery. Mm -hmm. But I'm just using this as an example to emphasize that fact that no circumstance will allow a Muslim not to pray. Now, when you are on a journey, what are those facilities that you may enjoy provided by Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I will enumerate them so as not to take much of your time. But if anybody is in need of further explanation, uh, we can engage each other privately after the congregation. Number one. When you are on a journey, it's allowed for you to combine two, two out of the five daily obligatory prayers. And what are those twos that may be combined? Your Zuhuri and your Asr, your Maghrib and your Isha. Again, under no circumstance must one shift the timing of Salah to Subuhi. Because from experience, I've been on a journey with some people outside Nigeria telling us to pray because our flight is five something. By 4 a.m., let us observe Salah to Subuhi because we are on a journey. That is not allowed. Allah has not given us that opportunity of bringing forth the timing of Salah to Subhi under no circumstance. Salah to Subhi must be observed at the appointed time. Whether you are uh, at the com uh, comfort of your homes or whether you are on a journey. But this force, just as I've said and as already known to many all of us, Zuhur may be combined with Asri either at the time of Zuhri or even at the time of Asr, it's part of the facilities. If you wish, by the time you're observing your Zuhur, it is permitted for you to join with that, your Salatul Asr. Or if the circumstance uh, uh, imposes that on you, that you are unable to observe Zuhur at the right time, then you can bring it to the time of Al Asri. And same may be extended to Salat al Maghribi and Salat al Isha. That is number one facility for a Muslim that is on a journey. Number two is that you can reduce the number of raka'at, the unit of Salat that you observe. But also, this is not applicable to all Salawat. It is only applicable to three Salat only. And those are the Salat that have four units. Or a God. We all know them. Zuhur prayer, Asri prayer, and Isha prayers. Isha prayer. So these three you are allowed. In fact, it it is it is somehow obligatory on you to do. I must also mention that. It's not a matter of I'm healthy, I'm strong enough, I don't need to reduce my solar. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu, that our famous leader, companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked the Prophet a very important question. When the verse allowing us to reduce the number of rakat was revealed, it was for a purpose. Because people were in war. They were in fear. That is how the verse says in the Quran al-Kareem. In khiftum an yaftina kumu al-ladina kafaru. لا جناح عليكم أن تقصروا من الصلاة إن خفتم أن يفتنكم الذين كفروا. 
you are allowed to shorten the number of your salah if you are afraid of your enemy attacking you or inflicting injury on you or trying you in any way. Then Omar approached the Prophet Sallallahu and said, when this verse was revealed, we are, all, we are in war. We are in fear, but today we, are, we feel secure. We don't fear any enemy attacking us again. Why must we continue to observe two units instead of four units of Rakaat while on a journey? And the Prophet gave this verdict. Sadaqatullahi faqbalu min Allahi sadaqatahu. That's a sadaqa. We all know the meaning of sadaqa. The Prophet described this as being charity from Almighty Allah. And it is no covenant on us to take whatever Allah has given us as part of his blessings, as part of his favors. So you not observing two units of Raqqa will be tantamount to saying what? Allah, hold your charity. Hold your gift. I don't need it. And it is not something that is becoming of any Muslim to behave that way. So please, it's not a, it's a matter of, okay, well, I'm strong enough. I don't need it. The Prophet said, Fakbalu min Allahi sadaqatahu. Whenever Allah gives you a sadaqa, please rush and take the sadaqa of Almighty Allah. So shortening our salat from four to two has been described as a sadaqa. And we have to take it from Almighty Allah. So that is the facility number two. Facility number three. While on a journey, you are not expected to pray nafila. The nawafil that are called rawatib, that are attached to every obligatory prayer. You know, when we come to pray dhur, it is recommended we pray four rakat as nafila for dhur, before and two after. Asur, in some narrations, you can also pray before, but not after. Maghrib, you pray two after. Isha, you pray to after. But all these are not to be observed when you are on a journey. A very famous companion of Prophet Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar, once led some people in prayer while on a journey. Then after finishing the obligatory prayer, he turned to them as the Imam would normally do and observed that some people still standing, observing some other form of salat and inquired what are they doing did they miss the obligatory prayer and they said no they were observing nothing I said this is wrong i prayed behind the prophet i prayed behind abu Bakr. i prayed behind omar i prayed behind Uthman. all were on different journeys and they did not do more than what i have done praying just to raka is a sort of from almighty allah he even added and said if you are to, if Allah had wanted you to pray more, He would have asked you to complete your four units of raka. Which one is is more important? Praying for as obligatory, or praying to then standing up to pray another two as nafila. Please note that it's part of the facilities given to us freely by Almighty Allah as sodako. So we don't normally observe the nawafil that are attached to every obligatory prayer. But that does not mean that if you want to observe free nafila at your free time, Muslim is allowed, a Muslim is allowed at any time to stand up and pray to Almighty Allah to supplicate to him after prayer. That is not accepted. That is not affected. But the, the, the ones that are attached with every obligatory prayer while on the journey, you are allowed. It is even recommended that you don't observe them as we have seen that in the reaction of Abdullah ibn Umar That is the facility number uh, three. The number four uh, uh, is that like Madam Mubarak, you are put on your, or your socks or even your hufu. You know hufu, that one is made of leather. Mm -hmm. That was the original thing. But it's also allowed. Socks in place of hufu. It's also one of making it easy for us. Islam is a very convenient religion that you can wipe over your socks. 
provided that before you put them on, you are already on ablution. That's a condition. If you want to wipe over your socks, over your hoof, make sure that for the first time before putting them on, you have already performed a complete ablution where you have washed your leg. Subsequently, for the whole day, you can continue to wipe over them. But for a limited time, it is for one night and one day. But when you set up or set out on a journey, it is increased to three nights and three days. That is part of the facilities for us as somebody on a journey. So if you have that habit of wiping over your socks or your hoofful, please note that it's one day and one night when you are at home. But when you are on a journey, that one extends to even three days and three and three night. Um, this is what I can remember now of the facilities that Almighty Allah uh, from His bounty, from His favor on us has freely given to us and are described by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They are His sort of way of giving us gift free of charge. And we are duty bound to take Almighty Allah's sort of uh, Finally, let me quickly point out some of the most common mistakes, common errors. Uh, in this respect you are allowed to shorten your solar the four units to two on a journey but that should not be applied when you are praying behind the resident imam in our various destinations is uh, we are not likely to become imams of the mosques that we are going to pray in but if you are allowed, they may identify you as someone on a journey. It's not even compulsory. Some people will take it as a right that because I'm a traveler, you must put me forward to lead you. It's not a right. You cannot dislodge an imam of a mosque simply because you are a traveler. So please note that. That is one of the exceptions. If you happen to be a mamu, a follower of an imam, you must pray as exactly as your imam does. Even when you are on a journey, you shorten your prayer. But when you happen to be, you want to enjoy the, the, the huge reward of praying in congregation, 27 to 1. That is the huge difference between praying alone and coming to mocks to pray behind an imam. That one is 27. Praying alone is only hands you one reward. That has been reported in an authentic hadith. So that is an exception, that we don't shorten prayer. We don't just come behind an imam. Pray uh, behind him too and say, Salaman, go out and leave him to complete his own. It's very wrong. In fact, it, it invalidates your prayer. You have, to, you have to be saved. Another common mistake is that, uh, please, when you are to combine on a Friday, do not combine Salatul Juma with Salatul Asr. It's a very controversial issue among the jurists of Islam. It's better you leave that out, out of it. Uh, a lot of a lot of Muslim Jews will argue that Juma is a special prayer. It's not the Zuhri that you normally pray on other days. So when you are to combine Zuhri and Asri, please take out of that your Salat of Juma on a Friday. That means after every Salat of Juma, wherever you may be, you have to wait until it is time for Asri and pray your Asri at the right and appointed time. If you pray alone, you can shorten it into just two units as usual. Um, well, uh, I think these are some of the most common uh, errors that I've observed uh, while being in company of people on different journeys. The Almighty Allah. Uh, so Sheikh, um, I think Allah some of those countries are non Muslim countries. Can we touch on halal foods? Thank you very much. It's a very important question. A very important question. We said it, we addressed this even during Ramadan Tafsir, that it is uh, one of the deficiencies, one of our areas of deficiency as Nigerian Muslims. We don't pay much attention to this, that we are not allowed to consume anything that comes our way. We are not to eat and drink anything that is presented to us as Muslims. We have what is halal and what is haram. And as you rightly put it, some of these countries are non-Muslim countries. 
don't be surprised. You may be, I was in Rwanda here in Africa in 2013 or 14. I nearly consumed pork before I was told by somebody that noticed me from far that this must be a Muslim, that this is pork. They, they don't write it because it's their normal, it's their normal routine, normal food. So please let us pay special attention to that one. You have a right, you are lodging a hotel, you have a right to ask them the ingredient, the, 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 the composition of what you consume. So please let us take note of that one. Being on a journey is not an excuse to take anything. You are here in Nigeria, in a relatively uh, Muslim country. Um, you can be assured of what you eat. But when you go outside, you may not be very sure of this. And in many occasions, in many occasions, you may be presented with so, what, something that is haram. So please, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, if you are in doubt, please seek clarification. Is your right? Uh, and, of, and if you are going to some countries, especially Western countries, and some advanced countries here in Africa, I usually give examples of South Africa and Kenya here in Africa. They are very attentive of this matter. They will tell you, even when you are in a restaurant, I've been in a restaurant in Johannesburg where they have a table labeled halal table because they know that there are Muslims that will come here. But because Muslims over there have shown commitment for a number of years, so people have, have uh, become aware of that, that Muslims uh, are not allowed to take certain things. But it is a duty on all of us to be aware of what we take. It's not an excuse because I'm not in my own home. I can consume, I can eat haram. No, it's not allowed. Thank you very much. Um, maybe finally, uh, Madam, may Allah reward you abundantly. So people said yesterday you did not conclude on the matter of raising our hands in takbirat al haram either to, our, to the level of our shoulder or to the level of our ears. I said, Malam uh, acted as if all of us are Malams. <laughs> Uh, but let me just assist him by saying the two are correct. The two are reported in authentic hadiths of the Prophet And that is the problem he raised, uh, he actually alluded to yesterday. Somebody knowing a part of Sharia authorities and wanting to impose his own view on others by bringing volumes of books uh, to bombard Malam in his house. But the truth of the matter is that the two are reported in authentic hadith. The Prophet will do this sometimes, and sometimes will do that. And the, both are reported by the companions of the Prophet <coughs> On that note, uh, since I'm looking directly to my brother, uh, not you, but I've observed in some other, on some other occasions, our brothers from the armed forces, you know you have the habit of saluting. <laughs> Uh, so people will be saluting when saying uh, Allah Akbar Taqbirat al I've seen so doing this is wrong. <laughs> your fingers must face your Qibla, your palm. They must face your Qibla this way. Yeah. Allah Akbar. Either here or even here. Just make sure they are all facing the Qibla. So it's not... <laughs> Very three quick questions, sir. Three? Yes, sir. Very quick, short ones. Uh, the first is on the issue of uh, Rawati. Uh, I have read in the past that, uh, as you mentioned, it's correct that you're not required to pray for those other ones, but the Katana and Fajr and water. I still uh, recommend that. I don't, I don't know if that is correct. It now. Okay, let me quickly address that one. Okay, sir. You see, when you are giving a brief talk like this, there's tendency that you will leave out so many things because you are in a hurry mm. not to delay your audience. May Allah reward you handsomely for that. Mm. I said, Nafila that are attached to obligatory prayers. I did not remember to mention that exception. Mm. One important exception is the Nafila of Salat al Fajr. It's reported in an authentic hadith that the Prophet 
ما كان يدعهما في السفر ولا في الحضر there are two nafilas that the Prophet will never leave will never fail to observe either is uh, uh, in Medina or he was in Medina or whenever he traveled out of Medina what are those two nafila? the nafila of Fajr Rakatay Al-Fajri and the Witr the last one unit of Raka we pray to end the Salat of each day which we call Al-Witr so those ones are to be observed whether you are at home or on a journey may Allah reward you abundantly Amen. and capture yes, sir. so you still have two more questions yes, 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 yes. so the, the second one is with regards to the uh, when you're on a journey and you observe Salat al Jumu'ah, the issue of uh, postponing the Asr until its time uh, are we saying that after you observe Salat al Jumu'ah in congregation for example do you have the opportunity mm -hmm. You should not observe your two rakat asr afterwards. You should wait until it's time. Exactly. Okay. That is what we say. So how about when you are not opportune to ask, uh, observe Salatul Jumu'ah oh, okay. and you are observing Salatul Zuhur? It's okay. You, okay. you can uh, combine Zuhri and Asr. But what is very controversial is combining Asri and Jumu'ah. So in any case, uh, as somebody on a journey, you may not be opportune to pray to join them in congregation for Juma. But if you have that opportunity, it's very good for you to do. Uh, but normally, if you pray your Zohr, you know you are going to pray a Zohr, then you, uh, you, you, you combine with that your Salat will ask normally. That is okay. That's okay. The last, last, one. The last one is with regards to Halal food. I have been on a journey uh, with some other Muslims from other countries, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we were served beef, chicken, with a lot of other foods, say fish and others, and I took chicken, and they told me that, am I sure it is halal? It's halal, yeah. So, because uh, you see, the issue of chicken is that in most cases, in most cases, in most countries of the world, they don't slaughter uh, their chickens, and that is the truth. Uh, they have some, out of, uh, some, some way of electrifying or electrocuting, uh, shocking them until they um, they are ready for consumption and that is not what we are uh, ordered to do as Muslims we must let that blood gushing out uh, of any animal that we are to consume so it's very correct but I know of many countries today that they will differentiate between what has been slaughtered by writing halal halal has become a trademark now halal so in countries that take this issue seriously there is halal certification all over the world. And that is giving even Muslims, uh, even non-Muslims are taking advantage of that. Halal market today is worth billions of dollars because there are uh, certifying authorities that will say, okay, we have inspected your factory, we have examined your processes of slaughtering uh, your chickens and whatever, and they will put that halal certification on it. So if you, are, you can ask of that if they have, fine. Uh, one of the facilities we must also mention, when you are in doubt, you are not sure that this is a haram, you are in doubt, uh, you can, if you are forced to take, you don't have any other thing to take, then you can take the opportunity of saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. But that, should, that shouldn't be in all cases. It's only when you are in doubt, not when you are sure that these people will never slaughter. The hadith that came is that some people have just embraced Islam because some people are misquoting that hadith. The hadith says those people have just embraced Islam. They are no more infidels. They have become Muslims. But we are still in doubt whether their habits, their practices before embracing Islam, they have not abandoned those practices of not slaughtering, of not making sure their food are halal. That is why the Prophet said, you say Bismillah and eat. Not when you are cock sure. You are 100% sure that these people are always preserve, producing or presenting haram food. So that is it. Sir. Sir. Uh, you know, we put one, but leave it when to Hajj or Salah. Because Salah is the Okay. And so exactly. Was normally passed from the president of mm. the mm. to the Saladin. Mm. Now, for those of us who are traveling now, what is the really? Because someone like
Premier, I want to do it for the whole uh, nine days. For the whole nine days. Yes, inshallah. Fasting <laughs> while on a journey. The Prophet Sallallahu has decided that matter while he was alive. In the hadith, he said, Laysa minas, Laysa minas birri as fi as uh, That is one hadith. I would mention the other one too, so that we have a combined reading of both to get the correct understanding of the verdict. In one, in this hadith, he warned his companions by saying, Laysa minas birri as fi as do not take it to be a, a, an act of righteousness by way of drawing you closer to Almighty Allah that you want to observe fasting while on a journey. It's not a special ibadah. That is the implication. It's not a special way of worshipping Allah to say, ah, I want to observe fasting while on a journey. But in another hadith, reported by Anas bin Malik and others, that we have been on journeys with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we will be divided into two camps. Some of us will be fasting and others will not. And Prophet never condemned any of us. Meaning that it remains under permissibility to do. It is permissible if one wants to observe fasting while on a journey. But should not see it as something that is very or so special. It's like your normal fasting while you are at the comfort of your own. So, sir, in answering your question, it is allowed. It, it remains, you know, in Sharia, we have five categories of rules. We have what is obligatory, we have what is prohibited, we have what is recommended, and we have what is merely permissible. What is merely permissible. And this will fall under what is permissible. Just as you are at home, you can do that. You are not prevented from fasting for the nine days of the Hijjah simply because you are on a journey. So that is the implication. May Allah accept it, sir. Mm -hmm. And thank you, sir, for reminding us uh, <laughs> that uh, that is the category groups one and four uh, belong to. Uh, we are going to start our journey exactly on the first day of the Hijjah. And unfortunately, uh, ending it on the 10th of the Hijjah. <laughs> May Allah make it easy for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, Alhamdulillah, and we ask him to please uh, be our companion while on this journey mm. and protect all our families and whatever we leave behind mm. our properties wherever they may be mm. and may he make this journey a seamless, a safe and some, a, a one that will be full of blessings and masses from Almighty Allah wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barika ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi